we've been looking at a message entitled, Can God? And the title of the message was, Can God Really Save Me? Can God save you? God did save you. He saved me. Can God really save me? I told you, if Lord wills, we're going to go on into a, a second part of this Can God series. And the, the part that we're going to talk about this morning, the title of the message actually is, Can God Keep You Saved? Can he keep you saved? Can what God has made available for you, can what God has given you, can he keep you saved through that? It's something that much of the church is debated over. Dwight Moody, a great evangelist, Dwight Moody, a, a lady had, had approached him after a, uh, after a uh, message that he had preached on eternal security. She came up to him and she said, Preacher, she said, I've been saved for 25 years. He said, and I've never had one doubt about my eternal security. And he said to her, he said, lady, you're probably not really saved. That's what he said to her. He said, that would be like telling me that you've been married for 50 years and never had an argument with your husband. And I'd tell you, you're probably not married. And he says this, he's, uh, Moody says this, he says that, that, uh, Doubt, all of us have doubts. How many of you have doubts about your salvation? All of us at some point have a doubt about our salvation. Not enough to cripple us, not enough to paralyze us. I, I've had doubts about my salvation. I've questioned, am I really saved? When I gave my heart to Christ, was it genuine? Was it real? You know, the thing that I've done in my life, the sin that I've committed, you know, has that caused me to lose what God has given me? You know, I've had those moments of doubts. And we all have doubts. And Moody says that, that in a statement that he made years and years and years ago, that doubt is to the soul, he says, like pain is to the body. He says, it's a signal. It's a signal that something is wrong. And just like when you have pain in the body, you do something to rectify the pain, to correct the problem. And he says, when you have doubts, you need to do something to rectify the problem. He says, and the answer to that is Jesus Christ. Jesus and his word. And so, this morning, if you're doubting, if you have any doubts this morning about your salvation, if you have any doubts about your eternal security, whether or not you've been born again into God's family when you cried out to God, get into his word, Moody says. Get into his word and study the scriptures for yourself and ask yourself, am I really saved? Read the scriptures. What does the Bible have to say about my salvation? Can God keep me? Can God preserve me? Can he do that? Well, the title of the message is, Can God Keep Me Saved? The outline is not in your bulletin this morning. Um, I didn't get here till later in the week, and it was impossible for me to get one ready before the bulletin came out. But this morning I want to look at someone, and I want to look at his conversion. And I want us to look in 2 Timothy and I want us to begin at verse 8, and I want us to read through verse 12. We're going to look at Paul's conversion this morning. And in his conversion, there are three things out of this text that I want to point out, from verse 8 through verse 12, with our focus and our emphasis being on verse 12. There are three things that I want to pull out of here today. We want to look, as we look at Paul's conversion, I want to point out that it involved a person. It involved a person. It's not something that, that Paul worked up, or as I shared before, Paul prayed down. It's, it, it involved a person. And it also involved a plan. And it also involved a permanence. This is the first point of this message. Can God really keep me saved? Can God really, uh, can God keep me saved? This is the first point. Point two and point three will come next week. But I'm going to give you enough today just to leave you hang to next week. Look what Paul says here in 2 Timothy, as he writes to Timothy in chapter 1, in verse 8 through verse 13. He says, Be not uh, thou therefore ashamed of the testimony of our Lord. I wonder how many of us have ever been ashamed of the testimony of our Lord. When we gather in public places and restaurants and we bow our heads to prayer, to pray, for our food? Are we ashamed to do that? Are we embarrassed to do that? Paul says, Be not thou therefore ashamed of the testimony of our Lord. He says, Nor of me his prisoner. 
He says, but be thou partakers of the afflictions of the gospel according to the power of God. See, we can't stand when we face trials and tribulations in this life. We need to do it in the power of God. In the power of God. And he says, who hath saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given us. I love that. He gave that to us, and that phrase means with abundance. He gave that to us with abundance in Christ Jesus before the world began, but is now made manifest by the appearing of our Savior, Jesus Christ, who hath abolished, that means he's put an end to death, and hath brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. He says, whereunto I am appointed a preacher. Not just a preacher, but I'm an apostle. And not just an apostle, but I'm a teacher of the Gentiles. For this, uh, for the which cause, or for this cause, he says, I also suffer these things. Nevertheless, I am not ashamed. See, now he goes back to verse 8, what we just talked about. He says, I am not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed and am persuaded that he, Christ, is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. As we look at the title of this message, Can God Keep Me Saved? And we look at Paul's conversion. Paul says here, that he knows, in verse 12, he says, he knows in whom. For I know in whom. Whom is talking about a person. It's talking about the person of Jesus Christ. So Paul says, in whom he hath believed. Paul was saved on his way to Damascus. If you were here on Wednesday night in our Wednesday night Bible study, we went through that. Paul was saved on his way to Damascus. He was on his way to Damascus to persecute Christians. He was on his way to Damascus to arrest Christians by, co by commission of the high priest and the chief priest. And he had an encounter with Jesus Christ. His conversion was the direct result of meeting a person. Paul went in there with, with uh, he, he had tunnel vision. He had one thing on his mind was he was going to Damascus, and that was arrest and persecute Christians. And he ends up going into Damascus blind, being led into Damascus. Not the way that he anticipated uh, his entrance into Damascus. But it involved the person of Jesus Christ. The word whom, I know whom, is Jesus Christ. Now, I want you to flip back in your Bibles to Acts chapter 9. Acts chapter 9, this talks about the Apostle Paul's, or Saul at the time, his conversion just a little bit. Acts chapter 9 and verse 3 through verse 6. It really talks about his Damascus Road experience. And as Luke pens this, in verse 3, he says, And as he journeyed, as Saul journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly there shined round about him a light from heaven. And to tell, and, I'm sorry, and he fell to the earth, and he heard a voice saying unto him, Saul, Saul, why persecuteth thou me? And he said, Who art thou, Lord, or sir? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecuteth. It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. And he, trembling and astonished, said, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? And the Lord said unto him, Arise and go into the city, and it shall be told thee what thou must do. There was a personal encounter. Thou, whom, in verse in First Timothy chapter, or Second Timothy chapter one, verse twelve, he says, Whom, whom is the person of Jesus Christ? There was a personal encounter with the Savior on the Damascus Road. And Christ designed this, this conversion. Christ designed this encounter 
to be, to be a very natural, in a very natural way, you say, well, when you read about Saul's conversion on the Damascus Road, there's nothing natural about that. That's a supernatural thing that took place there. That this huge light knocked him to the ground and, and Jesus spoke to him. Whether Jesus was incarnate or whether he saw him in his glory, I don't know. But it was Christ and he made it very clear that it was Christ. He had a personal encounter and he did it in a very natural way. Well, why was it very natural? How was it very natural? He got Paul's attention. He got Paul's attention, or Saul's attention, on the road. In John 6, 44, it says, No man comes to the Father unless he draws them. Look, how did God get your attention? Can I tell you how he got my attention? He got my attention through the life of my children. Through the innocence of my little children. On Sunday mornings, when they would be off the church 22 years ago, and they would say, Daddy, are you coming to church? And I would be so angry and so mad, and I would say, No! And God got my attention through that over time. God woke me. He didn't knock me down to the ground with a big bright light, but he got my attention. And if you're here today and you're a Christian, somewhere along the line, God got your attention. You say, well, I came to Christ because I was afraid to go to hell. He got your attention. He got your attention. He got Paul's attention. And he knew exactly what it was going to take to get Paul's attention. He knew exactly what it was going to take to get my attention. He knows exactly what it's going to take to get your attention. And so a very natural way, he got his attention. And then what did he do? What did he do? In Acts, 9, or in Acts chapter 9, what we just read there, he not only got his attention, but he made him aware of his guilt. He made him aware of his guilt. He says, Saul, Saul, why persecute thou me? Why do you persecute me? Why do you try to kill me? Why are you trying to destroy the church? Well, look back in Acts, keep your finger there in Acts 9, but look back in Acts chapter 26, because this is really what Paul attested of his own experience. Christ got his attention, and then Christ made him aware of his guilt in Acts 26, verse 9 through 11, as he was talking to King Agrippa, as Paul was talking to King Agrippa, he says in verse 9, he says, I verily thought with myself that I ought to do many things contrary to the name of Jesus. See, Jesus revealed that to him. He made him see his guilt. He made him see his sin. And then in verse 10 he says, which thing I also did in Jerusalem. And many of the saints that I shut up in prison, having received authority from the chief priests, and when they were put to death, I gave my voice against them, and I punished them often in every synagogue and compelled them to blaspheme, and being exceedingly mad against them, I persecuted them, even unto strange cities. Jesus Christ, on, when Paul was on the Damascus Road, Saul was on the Damascus Road, Jesus revealed this to him. Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Why do you persecute me? He made him aware of his guilt. Do you know how he made me aware of my guilt? He revealed to me the disgusting person who I was. He revealed to me the disgusting sin that was in my heart. Christ did that. See, this is a very natural way. He gets your attention, and then he reveals your faults. He reveals how disgusting we are inside. And then, this is the best part. He presented the truth about himself. He presented the truth to Saul of Tarsus in Acts chapter 9. In verse 5 he says, I am Jesus whom thou persecutest. It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. He presented the truth about himself. He told Saul, not in these words, but he, he told Saul, just like John 14, 6 says, I am the way. Saul, that's you who are trying to destroy me. I am the way. You're trying to destroy the way. You're trying to destroy the truth. And you're trying to destroy the life. Why are you fighting against this? He revealed the truth about himself. 
Jesus is the way. He's the only way. He is the truth. And he is the life. And no man comes to him unless he draws him. And he revealed that to Paul. He revealed that to Saul on the Damascus Road. So Paul's encounter, when we go back to 2 Timothy in chapter 1, his encounter involved a person, the real person of Jesus Christ on the Damascus Road. Now, Paul was very educated. He was an educated man. Again, on Wednesday nights, we, we were talking about his education a little bit. And I'm not going to turn to it, but he was a well-educated man. From, from age 5 to, to age 12, what, what, what Saul of Tarsus would do, and by the way, Tarsus, the city of Tarsus, was second to none in terms of, or second to, only second to maybe Athens in terms of, of uh, education. But Saul of Tarsus, from 5 to age 12, after he was done with his schooling, in the afternoons he would go sit with a rabbi. He would listen to the rabbi. He would study the rabbi. He did that for years. He would study the teachings of a rabbi. And then from age 12, after they were, uh, these Jewish boys, after they were bar mitzvahed at age 12, only the best of the best would go off to what they called the school of the book from age 13 through age 21. And they would study. And then in Acts chapter 22, verse 3, it says that he sat at the feet, or he was taught at the feet of Gamaliel. Gamaliel was part of the Sanhedrin. He was an educator. He was very, uh, he was, he was, uh, knew all about the law, and he taught Paul the law. And Paul was an educated man. He was a very educated man. In fact, history says that Gamaliel couldn't even keep him in books. He was so intelligent. And so Paul's life, I'll just flip over into Philippians. I want you to look at something else. So you see that Paul had, it involved a person, it involved a personal encounter with Jesus Christ. Um, and he was made aware of his, uh, he got his attention, he was made aware of his guilt, and, and, and uh, Christ presented the truth about himself to Paul, and Paul was educated. But not only that, look at Philippians chapter 3, and look at verse 5 and 6. And, and we look about his, sort of a, a little bit of his pedigree, we're not going to read all of it, but in verse 3, verse 5, chapter 3, verse 5 and 6, uh, Paul writes this about himself, he says, he he, he says, taught this. He says, I was circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin. If you wanted to be of any tribe other than Judah, it, better be, it was Benjamin, because the, all the other ten defected. Judah and Benjamin were the two tribes that remained solid, that remained still. The other ten defected. And he, he was telling them this, you know, taught this. The tribe of Benjamin and a Hebrew of the Hebrews, as touching the law, he says, I'm a Pharisee. He says, he says, if you guys want to brag, he says, I can brag more. Look, concerning zeal, persecuting the church. Touching righteousness, which is in the law, which is in the law, he says, blameless. He was a holy man when his life was compared to the requirements of the law. But his salvation could never be earned with his achievement. His salvation could never be touched with his works. His salvation could never be touched with his education. It could never be earned only through the person of Jesus Christ. And Paul makes that very clear in all of his teachings. It took a personal relationship. It took a personal encounter <clears throat> to bring Paul unto salvation. That's the same way it is with you and I. It's the same way. It works the same exact way. In fact, Ephesians 2, 8, 9, you hear this all the time from behind his pulpit. It says, for by grace are you saved. Through faith and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works lest no man should boast. We are saved by grace through Jesus Christ, through faith through Jesus Christ. That is the only way. In fact, in Acts 4.12, I'm paraphrasing it, it says that there is no other name given under heaven whereby a man must be saved. And that name is Jesus Christ. He's the only way. That's the only way. And conversion happens the same way for every person who ever gets saved. Not only did Paul's conversion involve a person or the person of Jesus Christ it involved a plan it involved a plan look back in uh, 2 Timothy chapter 1 2 Timothy chapter 1 Paul says in verse, uh, 2 Timothy chapter 1 verse 12 Paul says for the which cause I also suffer these things 
Nevertheless, he says, I am not ashamed. For I know whom, Jesus Christ, he says, I have believed. It, it had a plan. It involved a plan. Not only did it involve the person of Christ, it involved the plan. In John 3.16, which was our main text uh, for the, 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 the previous three weeks, uh, Jesus says that for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That's grace. That's grace right there. That whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. It involved a plan. Belief is part of God's ordained plan for salvation. Belief. We must believe in the one and only Son of God, Jesus Christ. But what is it that we believe? I want you to ask yourself the question. What is it that we believe? Are, are Christians, are you and I just gullible? What do we believe? Do we believe in fairy tales? Or, or is there a basis for the things that we believe? Did Paul have a basis for what he believed? Why do we believe, we asked this question on Wednesday night, why do you believe or why do we believe what we believe? Is it because your pastor tells you? Why do you believe what you believe about Christ? Can I tell you something this morning that faith is the root of our belief? Faith is the root of our belief. Now, oh, you can flip back here while I keep talking, but I want you to look at Hebrews 11.1. 1. Faith is not walking on eggshells. Faith is not walking around worrying about, am I going to lose my salvation? Have I lost my salvation? Faith is the root of our belief. In Hebrews 11.1, 1, it says, Faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. So what is faith? Faith is evidence and it's substance. It's evidence and substance. It has some uh, it has some spiritual steel in it. It has concrete in it. It's real. And God has given us some authentic witnesses and testimonies that we might know we are saved and going to heaven if you've called on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. God gives, and I want you to look at that in 1 John. We're going to be in 1 John here just for a few minutes. Turn back to 1 John chapter 5. <clears throat> he gives us some witnesses. He gives us, God has given us some authentic witnesses that we might know that we are saved. And I want you to look um, at 1 John chapter 5, verse 6, because John tells us that these witnesses are these three things, and you want to write these down. They are the, ex the, the, uh, the eternal work of the Savior. That's the first thing. They are the eternal work of the Savior. They are the internal work or witness of the Spirit. And they are the external word of God. Those are the three things that, that we are given as a witness to know that we're saved. John writes in 1 John chapter 5, verse 6, he says, This is he that came by water and blood, even Jesus Christ, not by water only, but by water and blood. Now, when he talks about the water, I believe that he's talking about Jesus' beginning of his earthly ministry. I believe he's talking about from the moment that he was baptized with John the Baptist. That's when his earthly ministry began. We put Jesus' earthly ministry in a three and a half year period of time. But when he was baptized uh, at that point in time, um, and, then, and then the blood, he came by water, and blood. The blood is the end. It was the crucifixion. And so this is the eternal work of the Savior. I know that I am saved because Jesus Christ, the Son of God, died to purchase my sin. That's a historical fact. That is uh, the saving work of Christ. What took place on Calvary's cross what took place, the transaction that took place on Calvary's cross, for everyone who believes in that, is saved, the Bible says. Is saved. Paul believed this. Paul absolutely believed this, because in our text, keep your finger in 1 John, and if you just flip back there to first, or 2 Timothy chapter 1, 
Paul believed this. This is part of his belief. This is part of the plan. Remember, it involved, a, it involved a person, the person of Jesus Christ. It involved a plan. Paul believed this. In 2 Timothy chapter 1, in verse 9 and verse 10, we read this already. He says, Who hath saved us, and hath called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given us in Christ Jesus before the world began, but now is made manifest by the appearing of our Savior Jesus Christ. Look, who hath abolished death? How did he do that? By his death on the cross. By going to the cross of Calvary. And he hath brought life and immortality to light through the gospel of Jesus Christ. Paul believed that. I also know, and turn back here to 1 John chapter 5, I also know that I'm saved not only because of the eternal work of the Savior, but I know I'm saved because of the internal witness of the Holy Spirit. We have the Spirit of God that lives inside of us. Look at 1 John chapter 5 in the second part of verse 6 through verse 8. It says, it is the Spirit, And it is the Spirit that beareth witness, because the Spirit is truth. For there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. And these three are one. And there are three that bear witness in earth the Spirit, and the water, and the blood. And these three agree in one. How do I know there was a man named Jesus Christ? How do I know that? How do I know that he was the sinless Son of God? How do I know that? How do I know that God sent him? How do I know that? How do I know that he actually died on the cross and took my sins away? How do I know that? Thank God I don't have to depend on somebody's argument. I don't have to depend on somebody's opinion. The Holy Spirit of God is here to make that real in your heart and in my heart. You see, God gave us the work of Christ. That's the, that's the eternal work of the Savior. God gave us that. But to make the work of Christ, the water and the blood reeled us, he gave us the Spirit. He gave us the Spirit of God. And look at, look at verse 9 in 1 John chapter 5. He says this, If we receive the, witnesses, the witness of men, he says the witness of God is greater, for this is the witness of God, which he hath testified of his Son. That word if at the very beginning of verse 9 means since. Since. Since we believe the witness of men, all of us, or most of us, believe the witness of men, don't we? Stacy and I, I left here Friday evening about 6 o'clock. And I went into Cassville. I was headed home. And I saw her vehicle sitting at uh, the Cassville Country Store. And so I wanted to, I flipped around, and I thought, you know, I hadn't eaten ate dinner yet, so I thought, I'll just slip around and, and meet her in there, and we'll go in and eat dinner. So we ate dinner in there Friday night. Now, how do I know my food wasn't poisoned? I'm still here, right? <laughs> but how do I know that my food wasn't poisoned? Because I had faith, I had trust in the lady that preserved or that made it and the lady that served it. We received the witness of men. When your doctor fills your prescription, or you know, when your doctor writes you out a prescription and you look at it, although you can't read it, you can't even pronounce the names half the time, and you don't even understand it, you, you give it to your pharmacist, well, we have a pharmacist in here, but we give it to our pharmacist who puts the pills in the bottle, and then without a second thought, when we get home, we take our pills and we swallow them. Why? Because we receive the witnesses of men. We receive the witnesses of men. And in the same way, through faith, we receive the witness of God through the Spirit that Christ died for our sins and rose from the dead. Listen, I, wanna, I want you to know this this morning. There is no excuse for not believing. There is no excuse for not believing. The Bible promises that the Holy Spirit that li will help anyone who believes, anyone who desires to believe and wants to believe in Christ. For the Spirit witnesses to us. John 6, no one comes to the Father unless he draws them. The Spirit witnesses to us, and then he witnesses in us. 
and through us. Look at verse 10 of John, 1 John chapter 5. He says, He that believeth on the Son of God hath the witness in himself. Before I got saved, before I gave my heart to Christ, he witnessed to me. Do you believe that? He witnessed to me. Before you got saved, he witnessed to you. He told me that what Christ did is true. And now he witnesses in me. Now he witnesses through me. And I have the witness in myself. Let me give you a corny illustration of what I just said. Suppose I'm sitting by myself and I'm eating, by the way, my favorite pie is apple pie. <clears throat> and suppose I'm eating a piece of apple pie and I'm just enjoying it. My daughter, Tara, would say, you don't savor anything, you just hog it in. Why don't you savor it and eat it slow? But I just, I'm savoring it today, okay? I'm eating it. And I finish eating my apple pie. And you come up to me and you say, you know what? I don't believe there's any such thing as apple pie. Apple pie doesn't exist. If, well, if it does exist, it's no good. Well, guess what? Despite your arguments, despite your claims, I have the witness inside of me. I just ate it. I have the witness inside of me. I have the witness on the inside. A Christian, listen, please don't ever forget this, a Christian with a testimony is never at the mercy of an unbeliever with an argument. Did you get that? A Christian with a testimony. And if you've been born again into God's family, God, you have a testimony. God forbid you have a testimony. A Christian with a testimony is never at mercy with an unbeliever with an argument. You want know why? Because the witness is inside you. The witness is in here. And so you're never at the mercy of them. Paul believed that. Paul believed that. He said, I know whom I have believed it. He believed that about the Spirit of God. He believed in the eternal work of God. He believed in the internal work of the Spirit because in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 18, he says, he says uh, be not drunk with wine wherein is that in excess, but be filled with the Holy Spirit. Now what's he saying? He says, don't let the world, don't, don't let the things of the world control and rule and dictate what you do in your life, but let the Spirit of God control your life. That's what Paul was saying. Paul believed that. And finally, he believed, he believed in the, the eternal word of God, he, or the eternal work of, of Christ. He believed in the internal work of the Holy Spirit. And now he believed in the external word of Scripture. And it assures him that he's saved. Look at uh, 1 John chapter 5 and look at verse 10 and look at, through verse 13. John writes this. He says, He that believeth not God hath, hath made him a liar. But he believeth not the record that God gave of his Son. And this is the record, that God hath given to us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. He that hath the Son hath life, and he that hath not the Son of God has not life. These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life. Here's the basis of our belief. Here's the reason for our certainty. We're not just gullible fools. Jesus Christ died. He came by water and by blood. That's the eternal work of Christ. The Holy Spirit of God says, yes, that is true. It's the eternal work of the Spirit. And it is all attested by the Word of God. So to doubt the Bible, John writes here, is to call God a liar. Some say, well, I'm trying to believe. I'm really trying to believe. But they have called God a liar, plain and simple. Either this is his word, inerrant, infallible, ever standing, never changing, word of God, or it's not. It is or it's not. And the work of Christ, the witness of the Spirit, and the Word of God all say that it is. It is fact. It's a matter of record, he writes. Now let me give you another illustration. Suppose I'm in a courtroom. 
And I had to use this illustration, but I used it in a little different way because we just gave away our daughter. But suppose I'm in a courtroom and the judge says, Jeff, are you married? I say, well, yes, I am, judge. Well, I want you to prove to me that you're married. Well, judge, let me tell you something. When I was in that church, oh, and I was standing up front, and I watched my lovely wife walk down the aisle. My heart went pitter-patter, pitter-patter, pitter-patter. Oh, it was just a wonderful thing. I was so happy. I've never felt so blessed in all my life. I've never felt so good in all of my life. And when I'm finished, the judge says, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. While I'm glad that you feel that way, your feelings are not evidence in this courtroom. Do you have some proof? Then I go downstairs, and I, and I think of the Hazard County Courthouse, the Huntington County Courthouse. I, and I go downstairs into the office that I need to go into, and I get that document. I get that notarized, that signed, that sealed document and I bring it back up before the judge and he accepts my marriage as a proven fact my salvation and your salvation does not hinge on our emotions and on our feelings I have an official record you have an official record I have the Word of God you have the Word of God and in verse 13 John makes that very clear these things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God that you may know that you have eternal life Paul believed that Paul believed that his conversion was the result of an encounter with the person of Jesus Christ and it involved a plan belief belief but Paul believed that look at back in your main text in 2nd Timothy chapter 1 <clears throat> in verse 10 and verse 11 he believed in the word of God the written preserved record the infallible truth of God's word look at verse 10 and verse 11 of 2nd Timothy chapter 1 he says but is now made manifest by the appearing of our Savior Jesus Christ who hath abolished or has put an end to death <clears throat> and has brought life and immortality to light through the gospel he says whereunto I am appointed a preacher and an apostle and a teacher of the Gentiles. He was a preacher of the Word of God. He was a teacher of the Word of God. He attested to the truths and to the facts recorded and preserved in this precious book. He believed it. He believed it. And so it involved a plan. It involved belief. And his belief was in the eternal work of the Savior. It was His belief was in the internal witness of the spirit and his belief was in the external word of God not only did it involve the person of Christ not only did it involve a plan but it involved a permanence a permanence I want you to look at verse 12 of our text 2nd Timothy chapter 1 verse 12 he says for this which uh, for the which cause I also suffer these things he says nevertheless I am not ashamed for I, we're not going any further than I have believed, for I know whom I have believed. Now, we talked about belief, but that phrase, I have believed, I have believed, in the Greek verb, it is in the perfect tense. It's in the perfect tense. And what that means is that it is in a, it's an action that has been completed in the past once and for all, and not needing to be redone ever again. Paul says that when he placed his faith in Christ, it was for a one-time, for all-time action. He said what was accomplished in my life on the Damascus Road was finished there. And the same is true for you and I. When we genuinely come to Christ, he does a permanent work. It will never have to be repeated. In fact, listen, it will never have to be repeated. In fact, it cannot be repeated. I want you to look at a passage of Scripture in Hebrews chapter 6. Hebrews chapter 6, and I want you to look at verse 4 through verse 6. 
It will never have to be repeated. In fact, it cannot be repeated. Look what the writer of Hebrews pens in verse 4 through 6. He says, For it is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted of the heavenly gift and were made partakers of the Holy Ghost and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the world to come, if they shall fall away, which I do not believe they can, to renew them again unto repentance. And here's why it can never be redone again. Look, seeing they crucified to themselves the Son of God afresh, afresh, anew, all over again, and put him to an open shame. If salvation could ever be lost, and it can't, If salvation could ever, ever be lost, Christ would have to come again, be born of a virgin, die on the cross, and rise again on the third day. It would be like me saying to a group of students who have enrolled themselves in my course of study, okay, those of you that have enrolled in my course of study, who have uh, enrolled in it and have moved on in my course of study, if it's possible for us to turn back the clock, which we can't do, and take my course over. You can't do it. And that's what he's saying here. If they shall fall away to renew them again under repentance, seeing they crucify to themselves the Son of God afresh, anew, he would have to come again. He would have to be born of a virgin again. He would have to live for 33 years again. He would have to go through all the things that he went through in this life again, including the cross. It won't happen. It can't happen. In John chapter 10, verse 28, the Bible tells us that you and I cannot be plucked from his hand. In Ephesians chapter 1, in Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 13, Wonderful reminder of Scripture, it says, In whom you also trusted after that you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after you believed. So we heard it, we believed it, and then we were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. And Peter basically says the same thing in 1 Peter chapter 1. If you turn there, 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 3 to 5. Peter says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy hath begotten. That means begotten. The word begotten means born us again unto a lively or a living hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled and that fadeth not away reserved in the heaven for you who are kept or guarded by the power of God through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed in all the last time. We know that Christ cannot come back and do all this over again. That's what Hebrews is telling us. Hebrews 6, 4 through 6 is telling us that he would have to, it have to be done afresh, anew. All this will be done over and over again. And we know the next time that Jesus Christ comes back to earth, it's going to be for his bride. And we're going to meet him in the air. So for those that believe that they can lose their salvation, if you believe you can lose your salvation, according to Hebrews 6, 4 through 6, you can never, ever get it back. You can never get it back. You can't. We're preserved. We're protected. We are guarded. And Christ does that by his power. By his power. Now, you may be wondering this morning why I've given the plan of salvation and an internal security message as the first point. The reason is simple, I believe, and it is you must be saved. You must be genuinely born again into God's family before you can be confident of your salvation. After telling about his salvation in in, in Timothy here, in 2 Timothy, after telling about his salvation, Paul shares with us why he has the confidence in his eternal security found and kept only in Christ. And next week when we come together, Next week when we come together, we're going to look at that confidence. We're going to look at, we looked at Paul's conversion today. Next week we're going to look at Paul's confidence and Paul's commitment. 
maybe you'll get some more insight into can God really keep me safe. Would you stand with me?